Yes, we are up and rolling on a uh, Thursday morning with Mark Riddings. No Will Schofield, he's just uh, just hopping his way from one side of the continent to the other. But of course, of course, tonight we're going to roll into the Shelter Brewery and have a heap of fun with a special live podcast from uh, the Shelter about what's going to be a magnificent 2024 season. Mark Reddings with Hammer Brayshaw joining on this Thursday. Hammer, hello. Skate, hello. Good to see you. Nice shirt. Yeah, matching shirt. Mine's yeah. extra, extra, extra large, which yep. my wife was very happy, I think, to, to have this on me because the last picture that was on the socials, it looked like I'd been rolling in um, sugar for about two Yeah, uh, with the speedos months. on, enjoying a little yeah, bit of Christmas. Good. Not That's a lot right. of good news out of that, Ham. I'm not sure. You're, you look pretty fit and cut. Thanks, mate. Trying my best, yeah. <laughs> But I'm still pretty glad to have the shirt on. Well, the shirt, just explain the shirt because I know it's uh, yep. it's one of our favourites. It is one of our favourites, the Bison. Uh, from the Allen Border, the win, he said, uh, got up there in his speech and said, look, I'm a bit fat at times and I love a beer. And we thought, geez, that sounds pretty good. Put that on a shirt. And uh, it's just gone gangbusters. So the back chat audience has loved it. I'm sure the Shelter Footy Cast audience love it as well. So we're, um, yeah, flogging them off. Absolutely. Great to have uh, Hammer in the house. Also, of course, uh, the Southern River Band for getting us started for this morning show. Uh, socials at Shelter Footy Cast. Footy Cast at shelterbrewing.com.au. Uh, YouTube back chat. We've got the Shelter Footy Cast playlist. Uh, it's all happening. And as I say, uh, tonight, live show at Shelter in Bustleton. Tickets available at the Shelter website or check the link in our Instagram bio. Apparently, Hammer, at 7 o'clock. Beers are on me. Yeah. Eight o'clock, the show starts. Uh, it will be recorded and uh, come up as a bonus ep- episode tomorrow. But uh, you don't want to miss all the, the fun stuff that happens in between, which is basically yep. uh, Scoey and I taking the piss out of each other. Correct. Getting on the cans and uh, enjoying yourself down there with a few shelters. Absolutely. Before we talk some footy, we do have a great... Uh, how about this giveaway? I'm not sure if you heard about this. Uh, Travel and Sport Australia, just up the road. Yep. Uh, Paul and Terrell Ramsey, they do a super job, and they've got a great team there. And basically giving... A couple of fans regularly uh, prizes a chance to go and travel with the West Coast Eagles. In fact, next week's going to be the first one. Two return airfares wow. on the Eagles charter. I think I put Adelaide first up uh, from memory uh, in mid-March, plus tickets to the game. We'll give out a code word on the live show tonight. More details on how to enter will be given at the live show. Uh, wow. You've been on, I presume, the Eagles charter flight have, back in yep. the day. back in the day, yeah. Yep. fans travel with you on those occasions? Well, we the only time I was in the charter flights was 2020, so there was no one else. So yeah. it, uh, I haven't been on anyone with the uh, with the fans on there, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be an experience. But, geez, Paul and Terrell giving away the goods. Yeah, that's a, it's a great trip because in terms of getting up close and personal, yeah. now, it's great when you win, of course, and come yep. back with the boys. It's a bit of a vibe. If not, yep. it can be a bit somber. But, yeah, get to see how they prepare, which mm. means they Essentially, they sleep or they play cards or yep. they play uh, some game on their uh, iPad. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. I mean, the, what's the flight to Adelaide? Th- two and a half, two and three, three hours. So you can get away with it pretty quickly. Some guys like to have a little nap. Others just can't sleep on a plane. So you can see the guys that get up and are walking around the aisles and doing all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, they buzz around. It's a good uh, spot. Now, uh, I've had a couple of nice moments in footy this week. You're back in... When I say back, you're you're on the cusp of playing some footy. Yeah, you? we are. We've got an intra-club tonight, so uh, I would have otherwise been down there at the Shelter Brewing, uh, Shelter Brewing, and having a couple. But uh, no, we're we're back. We've got I think we've got three or four four weeks until round one. March thirty is our um, Saturday the thirtieth is our first game. So yeah, it's uh, it's all coming along pretty pretty quickly. It's exciting. It's Good time, and uh, yeah, footy's about to get going. We'll talk some waffle footy a bit later in our Shelter Footy cast, but uh, I had a really good Tuesday night. Went to Trevor Nisbet's farewell at Subiaco. Yep. She was a walk down memory lane for the Eagles Footy Club, and also guys from the East Coast. Of course, Andrew Dillon, the CEO of the AFL, came along. Um, Brendan Gale from Richmond, Andrew Ireland, been around footy for a long time, uh, just to, to name a few. There were a heap of notables. I mean, obviously Justin Langer being a board member. DK Lilly, my all-time idol, was yep. there. And a lot of players from past, a lot mm. of administrators and, and workers at the Eagles from the past. And, yeah, Nizzy, uh, I think he got the farewell that he deserved. He didn't want that type of farewell. He wanted it low-key. Yep. But to be fair to him, he's he's been a terrific stalwart for the footy club and, and uh, some great things were said about him. A lot made about his short, stumpy legs and his uh, inability to play a lot of league footy, but he played a lot of reserves, played four reserves grand final in the waffle. So uh, he uh, didn't quite make it at league level. I tell you what, he's a giant of the AFL and and Andrew Dillon said as much. Yeah, he's, uh, well, I mean, I was at the club for, what, six years and he was there for my time. He was there for 30 odd years before me. So he's he's been around the park. He's he's done it all. Uh, And old East Perth, he was the footy manager at East Perth before he got his jobs there. So... 
Look, he's been a legend of West Australian football for a very long time. And uh, yes, it was, from all reports, quite a big send-off, which he wouldn't have enjoyed. But uh, yeah, absolutely deserve it. He's all the, all the premierships, all the success, all the ups and downs that he's been able to ride that football club through is, um, yeah, it's a testament to him. And he's, uh, yeah, certainly going to be missed. One regret, it was a Tuesday night, not a Friday yeah. night or a Thursday night. It would have really pinned the ears back. Yeah. There a lot of blokes there that would have loved that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we heard from Bill Kerr, uh, Dalton Gooding, um, Chris Allen going back to his East Perth days, Phil Scott, Michael Malthouse was there. Yep. Um, Dalton Gooding, I think I've said, there's, there's a great number of pl- people mm. that have been part of Nizzi's life, so uh, kudos to him. Well done, Nizzi, great career. Great, Nizzi. Don Pike now, the new man in charge. Let's hit it now. Show the footy cast our big moment of the week. <laughs> Happened yesterday, and it was Sam Powell Pepper Bang. with the AFL Tribunal. Three and a half hours was the tribunal hearing. The bump on Mark Keane, which left him concussed. Yep. And the AFL, now, I don't know if the rules have changed, but the interpretation and the penalties certainly have gone up a degree. Four weeks. What are your thoughts? Uh, he's, no, absolutely. It was... Uh, it was. I get that it's a... You know, you're trying to get yourself going for the season. He plays on the edge and he's an aggressive player, but to just drop the shoulder and just go bang the way he did was just stupid. He didn't need to do it. Uh, and with all the world focus on concussion for the AFL at the moment. To do that and knock a bloke out is um is not what you want and four weeks I think is is just. It's it's you know, I think we've got uh Tassa Crow sending the boys over to, to <laughs> play Port Adelaide, there'll be one down. So look it's uh you know disappointing to see it happen. Um but the four weeks is a just penalty. Yeah so you say and you've been out there. So I'm just talking as a as a punter who looks at it and, and saw the incident albeit in slow motion and, and the way the tackle evolved and the way the incident happened Port Adelaide didn't appeal, but they were, yeah. thought it was, it was very much excessive, the penalty. I suspect the AFL will have that as, as the benchmark. Now, because if you compare that to others last year, yeah. he's getting some extra um, mayonnaise on the top of the penalty. So is it because of simply, we'll talk about your brother shortly, but is it the even a stronger focus on protecting the head in 2024 moving forwards? It's got to be. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it has to be. The way that that... I mean, he obviously had the intent to just smack him, so it's it, you're coming through with force, and I think they're now steering to the point where any contact with the head is going to be met with some serious penalties, any intentional contact with the head even more so, and then with the high force. They've got... I mean, we had our we had our waffle sit down the other week, and it was, okay, here's the concussion protocols, and it's pretty strict. It's it just a, a grid. It's like, okay, there's high impact, there's intentional bang. That's what you're getting. And so I think in the past, that sort of stuff has been... Oh, there it is, but maybe we're going to drop him a week or two. I think they're going to be uphold to the letter of the law now, and there's just so much heat on the game for concussion and protection of the head that anything that results in concussion has to be looked at pretty harshly. They're just trying to phase that stuff out of the game. There are things that just happen in football, head knocks, accidental clashes. Like There's things that happen where the head is in trouble, but where it's an intentional contact with the head, they are, I'd imagine, especially early on in the year, they're going to try and put a huge stamp out on it. So off the back of that, uh, and we'll speak again about your brother shortly, the WAFL at community level and, and junior sport level are looking at a 21-day um, after concussion, 21 days on the sidelines. Now, it seems inevitable at some stage in the near future that AFL players, NRL players, which is I think around the 11, 12 days for each code, yep. that is going to go up. Is that something you feel is more likely than not yeah i think so and i mean i think the waffle has been a step ahead of the afl in terms of their sort of precaution for concussion we've had the blue card rule introduced there's been certain steps that the waffle have taken that are probably a, a step ahead and i think this is, is another one of them um the jury is out on the the time frame for concussions to sort of settle down obviously the the severity of them will will impact that but a mandatory 12 days, I think that's a number that's just been, it's one of those things that's just been plucked out. So, you know, it's okay, we'll sweep 12 days, we'll throw that in there. And he's, some scientist has seen a study and it's there. So there's lots of inconclusive evidence. So I think the more time you can give it, the better. Obviously, understanding that guys want to get back and concussion's a weird one because you can be you can feel fine after two or three days and you're like, well, I'm ready to go. But the long-term ramifications of that, if you do go out and get hit again, uh, are severe. So I think they're just trying to give as much risk mitigation as they can for the players. And I think that 21-day protocol will probably roll out, if not this year, at some point, then the next year or the year after in the AFL. And I don't think players are going to bat too much of an eyelid at it, considering all the the talk and the hype around it at the moment. And that being said, it's at the other end of the year, but looking at 
grand final week, more and more I feel, and if the 21 days comes in, it doesn't matter, but to have a week's break between the prelim and the grand final, a la the Super Bowl, it means that possibly players that are under some question mark or the, the concussion issue comes into play, that to me is, is a an obvious one, and obviously you get injuries right, but yeah, it's an issue that's not going away, and I think in many ways it was uh, it was, a, it was a, the catalyst for what we saw at the Tribunal yesterday, I might be wrong, but it was with Andrew, uh, Angus's uh, decision to retire after medical advice, we know yep. uh, the, the background to it, and we know that you're very close to it, uh, more importantly, a week or so down the track, it's, it's a bit like being made redundant in your job or, or, or losing something in your life, whether it's a, a grieving process, how's he handling it? Oh, he's still, look, he's still in a bit of shock. I spoke to him the other day and it's, the boys are back training now. They played a game and it's, you know, the world, it, it took a brief pause and, you know, paid its respects to him and lots, the media team at Melbourne did a fantastic job of all the highlights and all the, you know, memories about him and it was awesome. But at the end of the day, the season's coming. So it's, you know, yep, sweet, there's the blip and you've got to move on. So he um, he's taken a step back and, and st- taken a bit of time off from the footy club, which is um, understandable. He's He'll try and, I think, get back in at some point and be around the boys. But for now, it's just, it's a bit too close to home. So he's taken a step back. He's, oh, I think he's just going to be a gypsy for the next little bit and float around and travel. He might get out of the country. He, I just don't think he's in a point where he in a position where he wants to watch or be around any football right now so he's still sort of coming to terms with what's going to happen he's 28 he's had a great career but you know he ideally would have liked to have played for another five to ten so he's got some things to think about about what he wants to do but he's yeah he's come to terms with what's happened he's reflected with pride on his career and he's very grateful for what's been uh, what's occurred obviously he would still like to be there but I think he's uh, he's content with what he's done and now it's just a bit of well, give myself a bit of a break. He hasn't had a break since school. A lot of these guys that get drafted straight in from school, straight into football. So he'll take a bit of time. He's got the luxury now of, you know, having this ability to do, you know, pretty much whatever he wants with, the, you know, while his head's still going to be okay. So he can, you know, travel the world and see what's going on and, you know, just enjoy himself. But I think it'll be away from football for a bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't know Angus, but anyone you listen to about him at the footy club, give him the highest of praise. So that that's a bonus. Also, I suppose the other element, and I'll ask you, there wasn't a moment in pre-season that he felt poor. It was more just the updated medical advice, I'm guessing. And and, and the other fact that I think long-term plays into it is that his, his partner is the daughter of Danny Frawley. Yes. So that, that, of course, we know the background there. So this yep. is a, this is a, a very sensitive issue for for both sides of the family yeah absolutely and i think without even without the medical advice the question was still looming over his head as to whether or not he uh, he was going to keep going and that was always going to be a question you know to be made before round one and i think with the uh, with the updated medical advice he wanted to you know he wanted to be 100 percent sure going into the richmond scratchy um and the, the practice game and he, he didn't get the tick and it was in fact the opposite so it was you know happy that he got those that advice and the medical sought the medical help but um yeah, I think, look, from my point of view, from Danielle, definitely from Danielle's point of view, there's a bit of relief there that it's, you know, it's finally, it's, the quest decision's been made. I think for him personally in a couple of weeks or months or however long it'll take, there might be a bit of relief for him as well because it was a struggle for him because he obviously wanted to play. He's got this family, you know, history. And so, yeah, the, the fact that the, the decision was made for him might, might, so he might take a little bit of solace in that. But at the moment, he's, um, yeah, he's just taking a bit of time. He had a cigar after the GF over here. Yep. Does he like the cigars, does he? Oh, I don't think so. I think he saw the photo of Michael Jordan after the after his couple of championships and thought this would look pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I thought, yeah, a couple of boys on the, on the yeah. cigars. Well, gee, that's, uh, that's interesting. He didn't look like a cigar smoker, no. mate. Uh, anyway, um, before we talk about the WA teams and what's coming up this weekend and a bit of a, a look at the year ahead, today, news breaking about Harry Sheasel, uh, NAB, or AFL Rising Star, Winning the Sid Barker Medal, uh, the youngest ever at North, yep. I believe, 19 years of age. Uh, he was contracted until, I think, 2026 or thereabouts. Now it's out to 2030. His life is essentially now locked away at North. Yep. He's uh, he's a star, this kid. I think he's, yeah, from what do you have, 30 on debut at, uh, against West Coast. And he dropped the first, he missed his, he dropped his first mark, missed his first kick. And oh, he's, yeah, he's a young kid, he'll get used to it. And then just dominated the rest of the game. Um, I don't know where this one sits. So the rule changed, I think, back end of last year to have, now that it's anything over a six-year contract is has to be scrutinised by the AFL a bit harder. The president and the CEO of the club have to tick it off. Uh, came off the back of Brodie Grundy going from Collingwood to Melbourne to Sydney in a year. 
all still well under contract at Collingwood. So these big contracts have to be ratified a bit harder. And I think, I'm not sure how this one sits because it is it is a six-year deal now, but it is coming off the back of an already existing contract. Not sure where it sits, but this would be the, fir- this would be the first big one since that rule's been put in. And uh, to sign that big of a deal at that young of an age, it, uh, it shows the faith that they've got in him. But I've got nothing but hopes for North Melbourne Footy Club over the next few years because guys like him, like George Wardlaw and, and Nick Larkey and even uh, Jai Simkin, they, these young, talented players that are going to be, you know, obviously they've had some compensation from the AFL and no one sort of shies away from that, but make hay while the sun shines and he's the sort of kid you want to keep around, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, big dollars you expect maybe backhanded, yep. but either way, uh, he's got some uh, huge upside. So, Sam Pell Pepper, Harry Sheasel. Uh, this is the Shelter Footy Cast. We're going to talk about the Eagles and the Dockers. Uh, a couple of points to note. Matt Clark comes across from Richmond as the uh, list rebuilder after what's been a tumultuous time and a lot of mm. criticism. Now, uh, to be fair, it can't be just the list manager's fault that no, these things yeah, happen. It can't the, be. the club's in this position, but Matt Clark comes with pretty good credentials. Yeah, he does. Uh, he's been able to do some pretty good things at Richmond. And I think the good thing about this position is it's pretty difficult to go any worse. Uh, you know, not, <laughs> not having a go at the Eagles, but they've been ravaged by injury. It's been a tough last few years, and building this list is essentially you get a free hit it's uh you know you've you come in you've got an open slather to do whatever you want with your list and you can sort of guide the club into a direction where it's you know it's tough to finish any worse than 18th so i think they'll be uh i think they'll be better off for the um for the appointment and had just having some sort of clarity around what that looks like i'm sure he's got a vision about where the club he wants the club's list to go and list profile um, it's just about getting them on the park. You can have the best list in the world, but if none of the boys are playing, then it's uh, it makes it certainly difficult. Oh, which uh, the going through at the moment, we'll touch on that. Just uh, mm. for those that don't know much about Matt Clark, uh, this was Matty Clark who played ruck for Adelaide back in the day, wasn't it? <laughs> um, not him. It's a guy that helped uh, engineer, well, certainly part of the, the, the yep. team that helped engineer a hat-trick of premierships at Richmond. So that's where the credentials come from. And uh, as you say, he gets a bit of a, a clean slate to draw upon and hopefully not that Rowan O'Brien did a, a bad job, but he just, the, the body just went out on the, the park regularly enough. So uh, mm. good luck to him in his new job. Speaking of players out in the park, uh, of course, the Eagles take on Adelaide on Saturday, about lunchtime our time. Oscar Allen's getting some sort of head scans on his knee. Yep. Uh, off the back of Matt Flynn, off the back of the other injuries, what is this? This just this trend, this theme isn't going away, Hammer. No, it's not. Um, I think for Oscar, Oscar's a different case. He's uh, he's been at the club now for what six years, and he would have had surgery fifteen times. He's breaking records for the most scans ever. He's a he's a fragile yet plays. It's weird. He's got. I don't know, he's got glass bones, he's got glass everything, but still somehow manages to get out and dominate. So I don't think the results of this scan will put him off the park for too long, regardless of what it is. So he'll be okay. But the injuries that they've got and have continuously had for the last three years, it's uh, it's quite remarkable. And the way that these things are happening, Matt Flynn's hamstring that pulled from the top of his calf, and it's just all this weird stuff. It's, you know, you have to scratch your head, and I, I can't imagine how frustrating it is being in that position as a player, as a coach, as a list manager, as a physio, as a head of high performance. It just you just must be scratching your head at what's going on and pulling your hair out. But um yeah, it's another one that, you know, Oscar needs to get fit and needs to get back out there. They've got uh McGovern who didn't play last week. They've got Sheed that didn't play last week. Um obviously Matt Flynn, Liam Ryan, Tyler Brockman, there's lots of guys like that that's six or seven of your your best twenty two players that you can't that aren't playing. So it makes things tough. Obviously Jimby got knocked out. Um, the best player ever. So, there's, <laughs> there's, they're just they're they're just getting hammered at the moment. Oh, good morning to uh, Peter Sumich, by the way. He's just uh, left uh, the West. I know you do a bit of work for Seven yes, West. Has. Yeah, after uh, a dispute or a debate about Harley Reid. Um, yeah, well, we're not going to talk about the number one draft pick today, apart from the fact he had a little bit of a scare at training yesterday. And uh, in, in brief, what you saw last Saturday from him. Being used inside the centre yep. square, down back, uh, are you expecting that to continue against Adelaide on Saturday, or, or are you expecting a, a more permanent role for him somewhere else? No, I'd expect him to play the same role that he did against Freo. Uh, he looked like an eighteen-year-old kid yeah. who was, you know, a bit not starstruck, but a bit, you know, it was his first game of footy. Um, the thing that I loved about it was he got caught holding the ball a couple of times, trying to stiff arm, and it's like if you've got the confidence to do that as an eighteen-year-old kid, like you are gonna, and he's a he's a star, so he will take that. He'll, he'll adjust quickly. It's not like it's going to take him two or three years to make that jump. He'll he'll make it in a couple of weeks, but 
he, um, you know, it was his first game. So to have the confidence to do what he did despite not playing his best game, it's you, you can see that he's got that talent there. Um, and they won't throw the uh, they won't throw the baby out with the bathwater there. He'll have he has a one blip, but it's you know that's the role he's been trained in all preseason. He's ready to go, and he is just going yeah he's going to be a talent. And they'll try and protect him in, in many ways. I mean, you can't expect this kid to come in and I mean. Everyone talks about Chris Judd and what he did after one game at East Perth, but you know th- this guy's a different, different person, different character, and he'll clearly be a different player. We think. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it is so. It's unfair to talk to him, talk about him in in the likes of Chris Judd because he he might end up being a Brownlow medalist and a three hundred game player and a star. He might do. But to put those comparisons on him early, Chris Judd was one of the best players I've ever seen yeah. play football. And we watched highlights of him on Backchat last week. And I'm like, is he just the best player of all time? Bouncing out of stoppages, picking the ball up, breaking tackle. It's like, he, this kid might have that potential, might be there. But to put that on him early is, is tough and he's 18. But yeah, he um, he seems to thrive on the uh, under the pressure. He seems to really enjoy the, the mantle of being the number one pick and the best young kid. And you can see the confidence that he plays with. And from all reports, he's actually... He, he, he enjoys it, but he's quite humble and sort of larrikin in his ability. And he, I think that'll hold him in really good stead going forward. And yeah, the confidence that he plays with, regardless of how it's going to go, it will, will, he'll be in. He'll be fine. Yeah, any country kid, look, he's handling Perth pretty yep. well, I think. And and if he keeps an eye on the paper, he'll get his his head on there probably every yeah. second day. But bottom line is, as you say, Chris Judd. The other thing Judd didn't have to deal with so much was the social media just, yep. ex, just exploded <laughs> uh, in the last five, ten years. So uh, we hope Harley Reid goes okay. Before we talk uh, a waffle preview, the Fremantle Dockers, they've got Port Adelaide tomorrow night. Um, as much as we thought the Eagles were poor, the Dockers, there's some nice things happening there with their forward line, their mids. Are you, are you as bullish as, as you would be um, having seen them now on Saturday heading into to round one? I am. I think uh, their ball movement, they played a, a pretty stunted West Coast, and I, I think that you can sort of take a few things out of it. Their ball use and the style of play, I think at times was exciting. At times was a little bit like last year, so there's hopefully they can be a bit more exciting going forward. But the best thing, I think, for the Freo Footy Club looking at it was Nat Fife playing full-time in the midfield. He's massive, he's huge. And speaking to Andrew the other day, he has moved past the point of individual sort of recognition he's done he's won brown lows he's won best and fairest he doesn't care anymore about any of that he just wants to win um and the only thing he wins a premiership he goes down as one of the greatest players ever i think uh, and i think that he knows that as well and that's his goal so at a stoppage just rolled into andrew and said hey mate i'll just come and block for you, you just run off did the same does the same thing to caleb and no one can tackle him no one can get him he just holds his hands up gets the ball hit to him and then two two draws and then he just goes bang so the fact that he is out there fit and firing He's going to put them right in contention, I think, to play really good footy this year. And he's still one of the best players in the comp. And uh, from all reports, he's back. Yep, absolutely. And uh, we know that their midfield, probably, I think, a little bit skinny. If they can have two or three more quality players, it uh, doesn't hurt. We see Collingwood and the best best teams do that. But uh, the other kid that's coming through, and I've mentioned this, I've already banged on about Cooper Simpson, but I, I've seen a couple of things already that he might be, a, if not round one, certainly early doors. But Dockers, they've got no Luke Jackson tomorrow night with delayed concussion. Yep. And uh, off the back of that, um, Heath Chapman's gone overseas to Qatar. Must yes. Be good. Have you been to Qatar? To I never get... have. But the injury, it must be a, like a rehab centre for excellence where you just, uh, all the all the, all the the crocs go over there to get fixed <laughs> well, up. Well, I mean, all the, um, I, I, played golf with the, I played golf with the guy the other day that was uh, in, who worked with a doctor out of Qatar and all the some major soccer leagues across the world fly guys in there and Neymar's there and Messi's there and Ronaldo goes there. All the stars go there. So they must be doing something right. Absolutely. Uh, the other one, other player missing, just a slight hamstring injury is Michael Frederick, who yep. I think just precautionary, make sure he's right for round one. Yep. Uh, my colleague at 6PR, Steve Mills, has, I mean, he likes having a bet, has backed him and tipping him to win the Brownlow medal. He is... Uh, Michael Frederick. Yeah, he needs to be... At that's, what? Mil- Millsy needs to be tested for, for something that's... So Millsy's uh, got him at 4,000 to 1, does he? <laughs> exactly. <Ooh. laughs> but Freddie, uh, if you can do it, brother, I'll tell yeah, you what, you'll wow. make uh, uh, Steve you make Mills Millsy a, happy a very happy man. This is the Shelter Footycast. As we know, there's a live show coming to you from uh, Bustleton tonight, the Shelter uh, Live Edition. Hammer's going to be playing a game of footy. That's tomorrow night, isn't it? No, it's tonight. Oh, it's tonight. What's tonight? Thursday. Tonight's Thursday. Thursday. Yep. So, We're intra-club away. tonight. Intra-club tonight. Yep. Weekend I... off. Oh, oh giddy up here. Into the long weekend. <laughs> wow. <laughs> weekend. Uh, but uh, let's talk waffle. As I say, tonight, join Scoey and myself. If you get the chance, if you're heading out of Bustleton, come and see us. Uh, I'm putting on the drinks, apparently, from six o'clock. Uh, yep. Thanks to our friends at Shelter. We'll go through it sort of numerically, or certainly um, from what we saw at the top of the table last year. Uh, East Romandle, uh as Premiers, 
Peel Thunder they played in the grand final. Let's start with the running premiers in brief. Uh, again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I do know Bryn Teekle's coming back into the mix, which is is huge. Uh, breaking a 25-year drought last year. So, East Romantle... 25-year drought with an asterisk on top, please, because they uh, obviously cheated. No, they'll, oh, uh, they'll, sure. <laughs> yeah. that'll get back to No, they're, they'll, they'll be an asterisk on that one, but they'll they'll start well, two back. What is asterisk? They, 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 those... The premiership points you're talking about, the, yeah. the salary cap. Yeah, the premiership points, they'll start two back. So they were clearly the best team last year, without okay. question. They uh, they had the most durability with their players. They dominated. They made the whacker their home, and they, they really got that going. But, uh, yeah, that's going to pay them back this year, because I think they start two... Is it, I thought it was one, but I might be wrong. One or two I games I thought it was back. one games back. We'll get that checked. Anyway, but... regardless, they start behind the eight ball, which is huge for the competition. It is, and you've just... You know, I'm looking forward to East Perth and East Romantle. I'm not sure yeah. when you play each other, but that's going to have a bit of spice to yeah. it. Oh, well, we always do. They're a good side, though, and Brent Tickle yes. comes back, so that gives them uh, something them to look forward to. Yep. Um, we'll go through some of these sides. I mentioned we'll start with the Premier. So let's go through sort of al- alphabetically. Uh, by the way, Claremont uh, finished fifth. They won uh, an elimination final against your mob. Uh, and it was a, a real learning experience, I thought, for some of your players about yep. finals footy. They were beaten eventually by Subiaco. You almost feel that they're going to be in the top half of the, or top five every season just by pure virtue of what comes through yeah. their zone. They, they get really good talent through the through their young kids. They've got some star players. Uh, we talk about Freddie. His brother's come over from the Sample, so he's going to add uh, some speed and pace in that in that side uh, they're always good they will be Alec Waterman goes back so there's another a bit of depth they'll be they'll be pretty good so I think it's um you know they knocked us out in the final again a learning curve for us we had a lot of young kids playing their first game of finals footy we sort of still getting to know each other as a team and then under the pressure of finals things sort of start to happen and, and they were very good that day so all credit to them but uh, yeah they'll be good again they Abs- always are absolutely we mentioned you know Bolton and Bailey Rogers the two guys that are thereabouts Bolton playing a different role but uh, yeah, right. I just you, they've got too much talent available at yep. their Colts level, and and you know I've gotten trouble mentioning the fact they've got Albany and they've got Broome and they've got they got the pick of the crop when it comes to the country. So they certainly do. H- hence they, mm. hence they have a um, a very strong record in Colts footy. They work the zone well, as I'm told all the time. But yes, uh, they do. And I, I think the good thing about or the thing about that club is that and successful clubs, you always see all three grades doing well, Colts, Rezies and League, and, and that's an ex- they're a really good example. They never, that's been our issue a little bit in the past, East Perth, is we've had, we might have had success or we might have been playing well in League footy, but our Rezies aren't playing very well and our Colts are, are sort of struggling. And so you find with the good teams that depth everywhere across all three grades uh, has a real impact on how your league team's going. So it's uh, it's important and they do a really good job of that. Okay, that's the tie. It's just going back to East Fremantle. I had clarification that they've been uh, uh, stripped four premiership points and five player points for next season. And also copying a ten thousand dollar fine for breaching total player payments. That was in twenty twenty two, so not yep. their premiership year. Yeah. Just to clarify that. So, but uh, there's still a, obviously, as you say, when your words an asterisk, asterisk, asterisk yeah. oh, that's going to go pumping up the rivalry. That, no, that, so only four premiership points. I mean, they still would have finished had two. top. Yeah, two games last two year games last year. Yeah, so they st- look. They still would have finished number one. They still would have finished top. They finished two games clear on top. So they uh, they'll only be one one spot behind the eight ball. But it's good to see them starting one behind. Yeah, and an asterisk according to Ham. Asterisk on nice. Premiership asterisk. <laughs> premiership asterisk. Okay, so we've talked about East Round Brintico good, and we know that they've got some quality there with John O'Marsh, who didn't play in the GF by the way. No. So uh, Milan Murdoch, they've got it all happening for them. Uh, let's roll down and see uh, who else we can we can touch on in this waffle season coming up. Of course, starts on Easter Thursday with West Perth and. At Claremont. Uh, let's go to the next team on the list. Uh, let's throw uh, Subiaco into the melting pot. Um, again, a team that's always thereabouts, and they've got uh, a little bit of a blip the last couple of years because they've won a flag. Yeah, that's been the blip. The uh, they were they've been the dominant team ever since I've been over here. They've uh, they just always seem to be good. Um, I, I think they're very well led. Uh, Lee Kitchen is a is a fantastic player, and he's been able to lead that team. And after Hor- after Horse dropped out. Kitch took the mantle up, and they've just been a dominant team ever since. But I think the good thing about them is they've got now a young crop of talent that, uh, while they have blipped on premierships, they've uh, they've been able to bridge the gap now, and they've got guys like Schofield who have come through and uh, playing really good footy, and they're 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 just dangerous across the park again. So they're going to be hard to beat. They always are. It's um, 
I've heard. I'm not sure what Zach Clark's doing. Is he playing? Is he not? Well, I, well I've heard he is retiring. I've that, heard he's retiring, but there's been nothing official made yet. No, so I I, I, I've heard that two months ago. So, I, and the, look, there's still a, a tiny question mark, I reckon, on Lee Kitchen because of his. I mean, just getting through the preseason. If he gets to yeah. round one, I think he'll be fine. He'll, he'll be fine. But yeah. he's he's a ripper and uh, yeah, great fella. A bit of verbal between. Is there any? No, I'm not saying there is, but any time you two have a, there's a bit of yap when he's out there. Yeah, we chat a little bit. Uh, we we when was it? It was two years ago. We, uh, we 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 it was like seventy two to fifteen or something at, at half time. We smashed them, and they kicked two goals in the uh, opening the third quarter. And I was like, "Mate, Kitch, where's this been for the for the first half?" Anyway, they kicked about the next six, and it got real tight. We still ended up, still ended up winning the game. <laughs> but I said to him afterwards, "Geez, mate, that's, that'll be the last time that I ever chat with you." But uh, no, nah, he's a great fellow. They're a great. Uh, he he's just led a, a very yep. successful football club. There it is, Subiaco. We expect them to play finals uh, in twenty twenty four. Let's see if we can get a couple more teams rolling through uh, up the list. Uh, Peel Thunder. Yep. Where are they in the mix? Uh, obviously, it's all reliant on on what they have with their AFL listed players. Yeah, it is. I think that's the uh, that's the key with with Peel and with West Coast. It's it's a matter of their listed players from their team coming back. I think you saw it with Peel this year. They've, they've gone on to make the, they made the grand final last year and were able to be a successful team. They had guys like Will Brody playing in that game, and uh, you have that depth, so that really helps. Um, but they've also got the benefit of having a, a catchment zone. So they've got some pretty handy waffle players on their own. Blair Bell's played 100 games. So they've, they've got guys that have played a lot of football for the Peel region. So, again, they'll be good. They'll be better if their AFL list is healthy. So uh, they'll be interesting. They'll be, t- they'll be tough to play against. They always are, especially driving down to Manda and, and, and playing them in, you know, in their home in their, on their home ground so yeah it's uh, you hope to get them on a good week with injuries at Freo let's put it that way absolutely and one guy I think might make an impact because I don't think he'll play early doors for Freo is Pat Voss who was in the practice match last weekend he came out on primarily in the, the second match which was two 20 minute yep. simu- simulations I thought he showed a bit so again they get if, if Tracy and yeah. any team up in attack they, you know it all depends on, on what availability and he's going to be I think most of the year, unless there's injuries, uh, a pick up for, for Peel Thunder. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's it is the it is the way all the time. But if you've got a fully fit AFL list, you get guys that have played 30, 40, 50 AFL games playing waffle, and it's um you know they're too good for that level, but they come back and they have to play. So it's uh and especially if Fremantle are, when Freo are successful and they're playing well, the guys who get playing who come back and play for Peel. They, they're, they're playing for sheep stations. They're going for it. So it's not like you're coming back and, oh, you know, turn the toes up and playing waffle. It's I'm trying my best to get back into a winning team. So if Freo are successful, Peel are successful, it's uh, it's always they sort of go hand in hand. What about the Royals? Your team finished fourth last year. You won the Sandover. Uh, Angus Shoemaker came third. It was a, a pretty good season. Bear in mind, you know, you're, you're climbing up the ladder, but the next progression is to win a final and hopefully go deeper. Scott Jones was a big absence late in the yep. season. He had a couple of injuries but uh, I'm sure you're going to talk up the fact that there's a there's uh, more growth. Yeah, there certainly is. I think for us, last year we probably exceeded expectations of where everyone thought. We um, we jumped the gun on on being a contender I, I think was is the way that we'll probably put it. We um, we had guys like Mitch Croden and Mick Randall and Tom North come to the footy club and, and they've obviously been great for what we've been able to do but we haven't necessarily recruited heavily this off season. Uh, Zach Hill comes from used to be at Perth, went and played country footy. Now he's come back, so he'll be an in inclusion who's played some waffle league footy. But apart from that, James Starrick's come from Peel, so he's played fifty games. They're probably the only two that we've really recruited heavily on. Um, we've just sort of built that stability in our list. Obviously, Scott Jones is a massive inclusion. He helps us being back and gives us first look in the ruck. Uh, but then just being able to have. Liam Tedesco play with us for another year and, and Mitch Croden be there for another year and Tom North. It it just gives us a look of uh, continuity and I think that's going to be the big thing for us. So we'll have another year of playing together. It'll be much the same team. Kay Ditmar's the only guy who's gone. He's gone over to the sample. Um, apart from that, we've retained everyone. So it's been a uh, that doesn't happen a whole lot in waffle footy. So it's um, it's going to be an exciting year, definitely. Yeah, the waffles all the better when uh, the Royals are up and running. Perth, if they are up and running, that would be a good thing for the comp <coughs> as well because they've had uh, well very few fine times in the last forty years. Trust me, as a Perth supporter, ninth last year, two wins. No player got more than twelve votes in the Sandover Hammer, but they have done a bit of. Strong recruiting. Oh, yeah, they uh, have. Slinchog comes uh, back into yep. the mix, uh, ex-South from and played some state footy, and they went to Geelong to cherry-pick a couple of players. Yeah, they did. Uh, one of my very good friends, Charlie Constable's come over. Sam Simpson's come over with him. Um, they'll, yeah, they'll certainly be better this year. You can't have talented players like that come in and not be better. It not only makes you a better playing team, but it raises the standards at training. It, it gives a lot of these young guys something to strive for. They've got a 
they had a pretty good Colts team last year, so they're going to have some Colts come through, which is always important. And in the past, Perth have been robbed by the fact that they're best Colts players or, you know, they have someone pop up and, oh, they'll get drafted. So their only good Colts players will get taken. They had some guys go in the mid-season. So it's, it is always tough, but they've got these guys now that have come in and will make that team more stable. Um you know, no players had more than 12 sand over votes last year for them. I think Chuck, Charlie Constable averaged 35 and maybe a goal in the VFL last year. So I'd imagine he'd probably be polling a few more than that. But there'll be guys like that that step up for Perth and make them more stable throughout. But it'll also raise the level of the other players. It'll, it'll give them something to look at at training and, and it will bring them along for games. So they'll be a lot more competitive. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they win, you know, quite a few more games than two this year, obviously. But they'll be, um, you know, they'll be a much, much improved side from last year. I mean, don't say that because you know what kills football supporters is hope. Hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's hope. It's yeah. when you don't have hope like I haven't had for so long. Yeah. Ago. You know, that's fine. Just roll on. Forget about it. If there's hope, there's disappointment that comes with hope. So yeah. uh, I hope you're right, but I'm not so sure. Um, South Fremantle, disappointing by their own lofty standards. Finished eighth last year, 6-12 yep. and 12 record. Uh, but you get the feeling there's going to be a bounce back with them. Yeah, finished eighth, had the obviously the two game uh, back start, so that was that was difficult. They probably still wouldn't have made finals anyway. Um, but they, I think they're going to be another team that bounces back. So I'm not sure what ha- what's Hayden Schloss doing. He's retired. He's come back. He's gone to Darwin. He's come back. He's played late country footy. He's come back, and now I think he's playing again. So he's a star. He's a Sandov medalist. He's he's played 200 plus games, so he'll be good. Uh, Tom Bletchen is obviously a star for them. Izzy Winders come over, so he uh, obviously dropped mm. off the Eagles list, and now he's playing there. So. Um, and then they've got guys like Jordan Gallucci, who was at Adelaide's list, who's still there and playing footy, and, and, and that's another year on their list. So they'll be good again. Um, they're always a, they're a bit like Subiaco. They've been there or thereabouts for quite a long time. They've been successful. They've won premiership. So it's um, you know that's a team I think that's going to bounce back. Obviously got hindered by the two-game head start, and I think at some points throughout the year, probably when finals was lost for them it was just well what are we going to do next year so I don't think that record necessarily reflects how good they were and how dangerous they were last year and starting from level pegging will certainly be uh, will be interesting let's roll through our final two three teams uh, Swan Districts finished seventh uh, last year uh, recruitment wise uh, not sure where they're at with that but they're they're you know a young team and I think Andrew Prune's got a big uh, job in the fact that you know trying to get them up to that next level now, that being said, Tony Knott's on track, I think, to play his 300th game yeah, relatively early this season. Yep, I've uh, I've been keeping an eye on that. He, I'm pretty sure he's he should do it by round, you know. Yeah, early rounds. Early round four or five, I think, yeah. is something like that. So he, he'll be close. Um, from reports from them last year, they were, you know, they were hiking Bluff Knoll at one in the morning and doing all this sort of stuff to get them fit and ready to go. And you could see that they were a much fitter team than they were the year before. I think they probably burnt out a little bit last year, so it'll be interesting to see the difference in the in their preseason and how they um, they go about it. But they've got some dangerous players. I mean, Jesse Turner can gets it. He gets the footy, and no one can run with him. So they've got got weapons up forward. Tony Knott obviously is, has been down back for a long time, and and. and makes that back line work and makes them sort of in sync. So they'll be a, they'll be a good team. They're always dangerous, especially going to play out there. No one likes going to Bassendean to play the football. The abuse from the I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's a great spectating <laughs> venue. It's, it'd be awesome to sit, and, uh, sit in the can bar and watch. But, um, you know, they'll be there or thereabouts again. They finished seventh last year. I think they're a better team than that. It's about their fitness and how much they can keep guys on the park. And, yeah, I certainly don't – I'd not want to play them in uh, Knott's 300th because I think they'll be throwing everything at it. Absolutely. I think City stack from memory. I'm not sure. I think he might have gone to Swans potentially. for – Potentially. We'll wait and see what happens on that front. West Perth finished sixth, missed the finals, missed the finals by the game. I think they, they won the flag the previous year. So yep. <laughs> they fell off the cliff. But, um, I, you know, I've got a mate Muppet who works at seven and he's a mad West Perth fan and he reckons they will just – Lift so every team as we as we've just described are going to be improving, lifting, yeah, and yeah. winning well, more games. That's the good. I mean, the, the, looking at the waffle last year, and I think the uh, the thing that I'm excited about is the competition was so close. I mean, third, second to fifth finished on the same points. West Perth just missed out. There were there were teams. I think with the exception of Perth and West Coast last year, everyone was competitive no matter what game you played in. And hopefully that's a little bit different this year. But <clears throat> yeah, I remember Muppet coming up to me after winning the Sandover and uh, and he said, mate, Luke Meadows had 32 that last game and you got the three votes. And I said, Muppet, I've had 37 and kicked a goal, mate. What do you want from me? He's had 37 um, beers just in the yeah, night. Yeah. No, he's, uh, he's a massive West Perth man. But uh, look, I mean, again, they probably fell off a cliff that wasn't expected last year uh, whether it's a premiership hangover or not I'm not sure but uh, we you know we played them in the last round of the year and they 
were 50 points up on us at halfway through the third quarter. So they're they're a quality side. They've got guys like Luke Meadows, who's a star, and Kaitel, who's been uh, you know a, a genius of the game for a long time and been able to dominate that forward. He's, I don't know how many Bernies he's won, but um, you know, and then their, their back line, they've got some solid players down there as well who've played a lot of state footy and. You, they've got stars all over the park. So sixth probably isn't a representation of them, but at the end of the day, you can only have five teams finishing in the finals. I think I've said everyone will be <laughs> there or thereabouts. So it's, uh, yeah, they'll be good. They'll Speaking be good. of improving, yeah, from West Perth, Falcons, and uh, we know that uh, Aaron Black's uh, relinquished the co-captaincy. Dean Munns, I think, is doing it solo this year. West Coast Eagles, you know a lot about them. Yep. Won the wooden spoon, winless season. Um, we know they're getting a few more advantages or, or some opportunities to build their list. Will it be enough to make them competitive? Uh, I'm not sure. Look, they've got guys. So Jackson Nelson's obviously there. They've got uh, Jason Gilby and what's who else have they got? They've got a couple of guys that have come in and they're now playing for them. Uh, was on Collingwood's list. The name's escaping me. No, can't remember his name at the moment. That's disappointing because I've met him a Don't few times. Don't look at me. He's a nice guy. Uh but they've got a couple of guys that have been there or thereabouts and are now playing, so that will give them stability whether yep. they're in or out of the – depending on – regardless of what their AFL team's doing. Um, but again, it's like you can't expect the Waffle team to be competitive if the AFL team has just have been ravaged by injuries because – the competitive waffle players then have to go and play AFL and you get left with pretty much nothing. There were games last year where they were having sort of one to two players and one player had to move, you know, had to play a half because he would get taken off and he'd be having to be an emergency for the AFL. So, you know, Trey Rusco, there it is. Thank you very much, yes. Nick. Uh, so, yeah, look, they've got a couple of guys who will be there every week. Uh, but again, it's you just can't expect a team to be competitive when all their players are being taken to play AFL footy. Absolutely. Uh, it all starts on the Easter Thursday, West Perth, Claremont. Huge weekend of footy coming your way over Easter. But of course, we've got Waffle W starting this weekend. The AFL practice match is continuing. But most importantly, get down to the Shelter uh, Brewery tonight because from 8 o'clock, a live show, it's going to be Scoey and myself. Hammer, brilliant work. Love the Bison. Yep. Love you. Have a couple of beers tonight, Skeet, for you're, the Bison. You're a Sandover medalist. That will never change. Of course, socials at Shelter Footycast. Footycast at shelterbrewing.com.au. YouTube. Back chat, Shelter Footy Cast playlist. Beers on me from 7 tonight <laughs> at Shelter. See you there. 7 to 8.